seemed to all be for it actually happened. Uh, and this is kind of a fascinating phenomenon in itself. Um, but I want to talk about, uh, first of all, my own reaction. You know, like in any movement, there are more authoritarian and less authoritarian elements. There are struggles with the, you know, the direction of things. And this is, you know, this is true of any revolutionary situation. One of the things that I was very interested in when I was there was, you know, they say they're anti-state. Um, what does that really mean on the ground? You know, uh, because it's one thing, you know, saying that in principle, but you want to look at the little things often. Well, for example, there was that, that museum section of Kobani, the area they kept wrecked. Uh, it is true, there are like five or six families that refused to move. So the entire project of keeping that as, as like uh, a, a special museum zone has been really hampered by the fact that there's some people who refuse to move out, so they have to keep up power and services for them. Um, but you know, it never occurs to them to kick them out. You know, so if, if this is like an authoritarian regime in disguise, you know, um, they, they hardly act like it. You know, uh, when they were talking about rebuilding Kobani, one thing that everybody discussed, I remember the first time uh, I went to Rojava, we met this guy, we called him the hippie doctor. Um, he was this guy, he looks like this sort of intense, you know, leather jacket, short cropped hair, sort of military guy. But you know, as soon as he started talking, he was saying like, well, you know, we need to focus on prevention and our health plan. He was like in charge of health reform. Um, and you know, I think that uh, heart disease, a lot of, you know, even a lot of cancer, so it's really caused by stress. We're all just too stressed. We need more trees, you know? Like, I can't even be in the city. I get stressed. But, you know, after a day or two, I need to be around some trees. So, so he was planning to rebuild all the cities as well, at least 60% green space. And he said, you know, this will cause most medical problems to like rapidly decrease. Uh, but, but you know, you think some place like Kobani is perfect for that. They said, well, you've got a city that's uh, over 60% destroyed. I guess you should try it out, right? Uh, and they're like, yeah, I know, we really wanted to do that. Uh, uh, but the problem is that everybody who's out, like, insists that when they rebuild it, they want to live in the exact spot they used to live. You know, it's like a matter of, print. and so we got to do it, you know? Because it's all bottom up directly democratic system. So, so if that's what they say, then they can't say no. Um, so it really is responsive, but uh, you know, based on, on bottom up principles. Um, the other thing I looked into, which I thought would be the real giveaway, was cars. You know, because as you see, there's a lot of cars. I mean, most of the oil uh, it produced in Syria comes out of here. Uh, so the one thing they also the wheat, the bread. Um, basically, Tommy Slow, especially, but Rojava in general, um, was the breadbasket of Syria and the oil producing region for the most part. And, but the Syrian government made a point of not having refineries or, or, or mills you know, there, so that all the stuff had to be processed outside. So they've had to like smuggle parts and, uh, to create those things now. Uh, but so cars, you know, there's cars and there's lots of oil. In fact, all the collectives and local neighborhoods well, they would get like free bread and free oil, and that was it uh, at first. Um, that was a sort of negative tax system. Oh, yeah, that's the other thing, no tax system. Um, so <laughs> that kind of shows it's no state. Uh, but, um, but the, um, so, so, so I, I, I said, well, do you need a driver's license to, like, have a car? Or, yeah, right. Um, nobody has a driver's license. Uh, um, license plates. A lot of cars had license plates, other cars didn't, and, you know, sure enough, they'll issue a, you a license plate if you want, but that's mainly if you want to drive outside the region, you'll need one. Uh, speed limits, yeah, right. Um, but, but there are traffic cops. There are guys who, who are uh, special division of police who are traffic police. So I kind of, and you see them sometimes in the cities and sometimes they're directing traffic, but they do more than that. So I asked what they basically do and it turns out their main job, uh, and it makes perfect sense when you think about it, if you have no traffic laws whatsoever, um, is their job is to like pull children out from behind the wheels of cars and say, hey, you're 12, you know, you, you can't drive, <laughs> cut that out. Um, so, so that's basically the traffic law they enforce. <laughs> old enough to reach the yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, so, so, so really, um, it is an aspect, you know, that kind of classic state institutions, they've intentionally not restored. They have a justice system, they don't, they have, you know, the Asayis are not called police. 
Um, they consider themselves uh, a, a security force that protects society and not the state, as they, as they put it. And, and, and theoretically, yeah. everybody can be trained to be assayish. In fact, yeah, you just show up. And, and, and that's actually <laughs> one part of the interesting thing. I went to one of the academies. And the academy system is important to talk about that. Because uh, another part of the idea of democratization is to get away from expertise. Because the Syrian regime, the Ba'ath regime, was entirely based on the sort of rule of technocratic experts. And the technocratic experts, among other things, well, aside from killing them a lot, uh, lied to everybody. Um, so, so they told them things like, oh, vegetables won't grow here, you know? Um, so that they would be, you know, like to create dependencies between regions. Um, and yeah, so people were convinced that a lot of agriculture just couldn't be done there, which actually could. Um, and so, so as to make sure that nothing like this happens again, uh, they have a, this academy system which offers six weeks courses and anybody can take one. Um, and they have economic ones, they'll teach you, you know, proper uh, plant health, but they'll also teach you how to organize a cooperative. They'll have, um, ec uh, they'll have political ones, they will have feminist uh, academies, uh, a variety of different types of academies, and you can start your own. Um, they offer the, these courses, um, and one of them are security ones. And the, when we first went to one of these, um, they were talking about the six week training it takes to become a member of the, uh, of the popular security forces. And they would say, well, first of all, we learned that you have to have um, one week on feminist theory before you're allowed to actually touch a gun. Um, but uh, the major thing that really impressed me was uh, well, actually two things. One, another part that I thought was very serious was they had one whole day where they were to discuss an atrocity that was carried out by the DKK, basically by their own side, during the sort of dirty war that was going on, the civil war in, in Turkey in, in the 90s, um, to just say what went wrong, that there was a you know, massacre and a counter massacre by the DKK um, in that event, and how to make sure that nothing like that ever happened again. Um, but um, the, what they finally said is, well, you know, ultimately we like to get in a position where the security forces, um, you know, the police, don't carry weapons. Um, it's not an option now. You know, people just come in and do suicide bombings or shootings in like uh, civil buildings all the, frequently. You know, they're, they're under attack all the time. People trying to infiltrate. So there's a reason why there's checkpoints everywhere. They said, well, yeah, we'd like to get to that point. But what we really like to get to is a point where we give everybody in the country six weeks of secure police training and then abolish the police. Mm -hmm. That was the ultimate dream. Um, okay, so that's the ideal of the academy system. Um, how did I bring that up? Oh, I was talking about security. Um, so, so there's a security system. The idea is a security system is answerable to the bottom-up structures. And, and this is one thing that politically I think is actually really interesting uh, about Rojava as an experiment and as a political experiment we need to be thinking about. Because they're, you know, they're really encountering the kind of problems thinking about this and Occupy, that, you know, and there was one point uh, after the evictions that I thought, well, maybe we should get together a, a whole group of people, like, you know, we've got the unions, we've got all these allies, we've got all these intellectuals, and people with experience, and sit down and say, let's imagine we actually did get New York City, how would we run it, you know? Um, and these people actually have that problem. You know, they're, 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 they have to, what, I mean, they're not cities like New York. Uh, they don't have a banking system that they have to worry about. Um, in a lot of ways, it's a very undeveloped um, economy. But you know, nonetheless, they um, you know they have to run the sewer system. They have to run the electrical grid. They, um, they, they have to work out all of these problems. But, uh, but even more, they have to relate to other entities. And um, one thing, you know, when you actually have to solve these problems, things you wouldn't have necessarily anticipated become things. Sometimes things that you thought were going to be hard turn out to be easy. But other things you never even occurred to were going to be problems at all turn out to be really hard. And, and one of the big problems that you have is you're trying to organize a bottom-up democratic confederate system direct, you know, feminist ecological direct democracy is how to deal with, with, with outside organizations which are organized on totally different principles. This is something that pops up any time you're trying to do a, a, a organization that operates in principles of uh, democratic principles, and it's a big thing in anarchist circles. Um, you know, how do you deal with organizations that are top down? But it's a big problem if you're doing something like creating an autonomous region. You don't want to be a nation state. You don't want to be a government uh, or a state. 
but you have to be taken seriously. And, and for, um, it, you have already, both with states and organizations that assume that anybody worth dealing with is a state. <coughs> and this was really brought home to me when, um, when I was in Kamislo, there's one area of Kamislo, which is like the largest city. Uh, well, I guess Mombij is now, if you consider it part of But Kamislo is a, a sort of the center of it. Uh, if it had a capital, that would be it. Um, okay, in Kamislo, there's actually an area still under Syrian government control. Because yeah, the Syrian government basically, there was a negotiation and they agreed to leave. Um, so they pulled up stakes and left. They took out everything. They took out the light bulbs in the government building. They just stripped the place down, took off. Um, and all the sort of flunkies and crony capitalist friends of the, of the regime left too, which meant that the land problem wasn't nearly so much of a problem as it was going to be uh, otherwise. But um, okay, so the government took off, but there's one area that's still there. And it's like one street around the central post office, which leads to the airport. And the airport is still under official government control. And I realized, like, well, that kind of makes sense because if you have an airport, what are you going to do with it? I mean, it's not like they have military problems, right? Um, but, um, you know, in order, and, and it made me think of all the legalities and structures that are required. I mean, if you want to fly a plane from, you know, from Kamislo to anywhere else, you're going to need aviation agreements, you're going to have to be 